So if the, we, we use this twice. If we're doing like shallow uh, borings that are, you know, two, four, maybe up to six or eight feet, Don't put them in yet. Listen, we actually them. use this instead of this machine um, to use it. So basically what we do is we come in here and I take that from a specified level, which that's approximately three feet. I just know that. So we'll take that soil. We have a, a 16 ounce glass mason jar. We fill it up halfway with that soil. Then we put a piece of aluminum foil over the top of it to seal it. Uh, and then we let it sit for, you know, two or three minutes. Then this is what we use that tool. So basically what it is, is you pierce the top of the aluminum foil, read what's in the headspace of that jar. And we take that reading. And that's reading for hydrocarbons? Yes. Anything that's volatile, uh, organic, most of the time it's hydrocarbons. Uh, there's a, uh, this one is a PID, it's a photo ionization detector, uh, uses UV light. Um, this will actually detect uh, chlorinated solvents as well. There's another one that's called a flame ionization detector. It will only detect uh, volatile organics like petroleum. It won't detect because Chlorinated solvents aren't combustible. Other times when you go out to a site, you got a number of different sensors based on what they think is already in there. Um, the broad range. You can sometimes, but generally that's why we use this one is because it will look at both uh, volatile organic compounds such as gas and everything, but then it also see any kind of other uh, chlorinated solvent type material. And from chlorinated solvents, that's like dry cleaning, dry cleaners which is PCE. Then you have other uh, cleaners like brake cleaner, which consists of like acetone, TCE, what we call TCE. Um, that's generally where it comes from. So basically this machine here, it drives this rod, these rods. It, it basically has a Y'all will understand this, but it's basically 550 foot pounds of pressure that it will, or force that it will apply to those rods. And it basically just hammers it. And it'll do that. It's actually equivalent to about 20 times per second. 550 pounds of force, 20 times a second. So basically we'll show y'all what it does. All right, so basically what we do is we repeat that step over and over. We'll just keep putting tubes and additional rods on it. This machine will go to about 100 feet. We can push those rods about 100 feet. 
Um, so you hit water? We will. I mean, eventually you, you will. If you yeah, went down yeah. I think it's roughly around 40 feet is what I would suggest, I, what I think that it is. So basically what it is is this is the bottom here is roughly about 10 feet below where you're standing now. So basically what we do is every two feet we take this soil, put it in the glass jars like what I'm talking about. And so basically what we do is we, in addition to this right here, we actually characterize the soil that we get because it helps us to determine what technology we're going to use to remediate um, the contaminants. So this material right here, um, y'all are more than welcome to play it in the dirt if you want, um, is got a lot of clay in it. So it's a, probably what we would call a sandy uh, clay or a, a silty, kind of a, yeah, it's got some silty clays and some sandy clays in it. Um, so basically water doesn't penetrate, water will penetrate this, um, but a lot slower than so say- it floods here really easily? It can, some places. So generally, then this is what is roughly at about five feet. So it's a lot sandier. Um, that's actually what they call a, a loamy soil. So it's got a little, it's real fine. Doesn't necessarily have clay in it. It's just really fine. So basically what you got in Florida is our hydrology is kind of unique to anywhere else in the country, really. Uh, basically you see these little cypress ponds or you'll just come and you'll see a little pond stuck out in the middle of nowhere. So basically what that is, is this right here, that just makes a little bowl. That's essentially what it is, so it holds water. That's all that it is. Um, generally, whenever you have sand over the top of it, water, rainwater goes down, then it goes out, or it goes down, okay? But if it hits clay, and clay is really close at the surface, it'll actually puddle and hold, hold the water. So is that like an ephemeral wetland then situation? Like if you've got long leaf pine, and, you know, mm -hmm. and then uplands, and then you've got... Yep. And just say, they call it a depressional, I think is what most of the time what they, uh, what they call it. Um, but basically, that's what we do. Um, it's just, uh, this is the initial phase of a cleanup. Typically, whenever we go for the first time to go to a site and start doing this type of assessment, it may take a, we may be done in a month or just a couple of, a couple of events, one event. Sometimes there's projects that I've worked on 20 years from assessment to remediation to monitoring and everything before we can, what they call close out a site. Um, and so we have to report all that to the Department of Environmental Protection. So, and they, they kind of oversee a lot of that. What we do is we're one of the state cleanup contractors for petroleum. And so the state actually assigns us sites where they know that there's contamination. So and then we go. dollars are yep. paying yep. to clean up the contamination. Yep, basically every three or four cents of every gallon that you put in, the, put in your car, it comes to the state in a trust fund which is $230 million a year. And they, they set aside approximately 135 to $150 million a year to do this. Is that part of Superfund? Nope. Okay. Superfund is a RECRA. That's EPA under the RECRA. So that's the same concept. It's the same concept. Okay. It's just at the federal level. This is just at the state level. Generally, the most of our work, Pensacola to Jacksonville, down to Ocala, is most of where we do. That's where our contract is. But we've went all over the state, Georgia, Alabama. Uh, generally, that's the area that we stay in. So the way you operate is pretty much the same throughout the country because it's under the EPA, or is there differences in Florida versus Nashville? Every state is different. So the one thing about Florida and uh, Actually, I was just with, actually, Peter, 
and now he works, he worked at DEP, and now he works at multiple agencies around the country. Florida, see, Florida and California are probably have the best environmental programs in the country. As far as regulatory. As far as regulatory. Yeah. Um, California is really, really strict. Florida's pretty strict, but that's just to protect the groundwater here. But Florida puts a lot of money into actual cleanup. Um, they have a lot lower, um, uh, not really more regulations, they have more stringent regulations actually than the EPA puts out. So they actually take it a little bit, a little bit higher. So the EPA, they get their numbers based on the whole US. Florida gets theirs based on just Florida because the lithology, the, ground, the hydrology, everything in Florida is totally different than out west, say in Colorado. That's totally different. EPA looks at the whole country, Florida just looks at theirs. So and what uh, EPA says, it's these are your guidelines, or if your state has more stringent guidelines, that's what you have to follow. So people could vote on how much of that gallon of gas goes to you guys, is it that three or four percent here? Is it less in other states or they just have fewer people? Other states don't do it. They don't necessarily do it. This is something specific to Florida. Is it because we have the aquifer? Yes. That's because we're the only state that gets the, what, 90, thing, I think it's 97% of all our, our drinking water comes from the aquifer. Everywhere else in the country is surface water, a lot of it's surface water, some of it's groundwater. So we have the Florida aquifer here, which is one of the most productive aquifers in actually I think the world, which actually starts, you're drinking water right here that starts in North Carolina that falls in North Carolina. So it falls and actually starts in the Appalachian Mountains, Tennessee, North Carolina, North Georgia. And then it ends up coming down here. And we're kind of, we're about to the western edge of the Florida aquifer. It doesn't go very much further. Like Mariana, Crest, or Defuniac Springs, that's about the, the limit of that. That's where you see your springs. Correct. So and that's like about five minutes. Okay. Um, do you want to do Q and A? Yeah. Y'all got any questions? How deep did you say you guys would go with this thing? On average, we generally do 20 to 50 feet, but this machine will go to 100. And we will do uh, another thing that I, I didn't show y'all. So, whenever this is just the soil part of it, there's a groundwater component of it. This machine will also will put in what we call a monitoring well where we actually have augers that go in there. They're about this big. They auger down into the ground and we put a screen and uh, a PVC, basically PVC pipe with slots cut in it. And we set that into the water table. Then we can come back at any given time and collect a groundwater sample. So where would you put in the monitoring well? At any place where there's soil contamination, we generally have to look to make sure that that soil contamination didn't make it down to the groundwater. Yep. Do you think this water, or do you think the soil is contaminated here? No. no. I doubt it. Because <laughs> <laughs> no. there's no gas station, yeah. there's no dry cleaners, there, it, it may, maybe if this had been an agricultural citrus farm or something a long time ago, it's, there might be contamination still from a long time ago, but can you mm -hmm. ever tell just by looking at it, like, oh, this is bad? You can, you can actually, if, if it was bad, I could smell it right here. Oh, really? Yeah, no, it smelled just like, dirt. no, it smells like gas. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm saying yeah. this smells like dirt. Yeah, no, this smells like dirt. Uh, generally, whenever we get to it, actually, some of the times it's so bad whenever we're drilling, we actually have to put fans up to where they don't breathe it. So we actually take this, monitor the air that we're breathing. If the levels get so bad to a certain level, then we actually have to put respirators on to actually filter the air that we breathe. And is so. that usually around like a gas station? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Will you tell them real quick, I don't know if they, they heard this because they kind of came up in, in groups, but that you are an environmental engineer. Can yeah. you talk and just say a little bit about what you're from high school yeah, on, what you did? All right. So I grew up in Louisiana. I grew up, and the reason I guess I got into engineering was because of just working with my dad, fixing things, 
building things. We had a farm. Um, it's just something that always interested me. I went to the University of Florida and I, my degree is in environmental engineering. There's a lot of different engineering disciplines. I just liked environmental part of it. Um, so I've done this now for 15 years with this company and I've done it with a big national or international firm before this. Um, got to go see some really cool places. Got to work at a lot of Air Force bases and everything else that was really cool. Um, I guess uh, it's pretty, you know, it, I've, I've seen a lot with it. You get to do a lot, environmental. I ain't speak for environmental. There's a lot of different aspects to environmental. It's one of the broadest engineering disciplines because we at our company, not only do we do this with contamination, we also design water and wastewater treatment plants, um, treat water that you drink. Um, we also design wells that they actually recover that large diameter wells that provide you water that you drink. So that's another thing that we do. Um, so, so other a lot people in this industry that would work with the environmental engineers would be people like hydrogeologists. So if you're more interested in rocks and geology, they would do more of what's happening right now, the assessment. Like mm -hmm. those guys and girls would be the ones who figure out, okay, this is how contaminated this, this place is. And then they would transfer that data over to the engineers. Mm -hmm. um, and my background is environmental science. I did kind of like a mix of both environmental engineering and geology. I, I liked all of it. And so I was sort of more like a geologist, whereas like the drillers, you know, they'd come out with the, the sample. And then, like you said, you'd have the mason jar. And so it's kind of like a team effort. You know, one person's doing the drill and you're like, you know, doing it around and then having to write reports and all that kind of thing. So there's, yep. there's a lot of different ways to kind of enter into this field other than um, engineering. So. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, you can have, I mean, we've got people with geology degrees. We have people with engineering science degrees. Um, some people, they could have a business degree. I mean, somebody, yeah, I mean, you, you can learn how to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a whole different, there's a lot more to this than just this is a very brief, um, but it's an interesting field. You get to see a lot of cool things. Um, it's, it's very interesting. There's a lot of science behind it. So. Well, can you guys say thank you? Yep. Thank you all.